All right, so a warm welcome to you in the audience, but also a warm welcome to you out there who we hope are numerous to watch this event that we have called Partnerships for Scaling Climate Solutions. My name is Paul Friesvold. I work for Sintef Norwegian Research Institute, and I have the privilege to steer this, or monitor, or whatever, this conversation here today. Um, I think maybe we, we should start with the beginning, in the sense that Antonio Guterres, in his now infamous opening statement with a highway to climate hell, he also said something very uh, pertinent to this conversation, which was cooperate or perish. And I think that uh, assembles very well what we are trying to talk about here today. We are privileged to have with us four different, shall we say, business segments that are all key to ensure that we advance the climate solutions. So, to start, we are very fortunate to have with us Elizabeth Brinton, who is Vice Press, Corporate Vice President of Sustainability of Microsoft. And, you know, Microsoft is obviously a first mover. Uh, your ambition to remove all historic emissions is an inspiration to all of us. So, Elizabeth, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the warm welcome and a warm welcome to all of us on the virtual audience. First of all, you know our Microsoft commitments. What we're doing now is it's all about action. I think those of us here at COP, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, closer. Uh, so those of us here at COP, we're here today to really push forward moving into action. And so one of the things for Microsoft is, as you said, we're so we are committed to remove our whole historic footprint around carbon. And so to do that, that requires a whole combination of credible and verified engineered solutions and natural solutions, and then the mechanisms with which to have the verification because ultimately sustainability is a trust mechanism. And so for us, as a software company, part of our focus is making sure that then we have the digital infrastructure to go along with the physical infrastructure, capabilities like CCUS or direct air capture enabled. So the software does two things. First and foremost, it can be providing part of that verification and measurement, part of that enablement of the supply chain and then markets as well, and certification. But then at a deeper operational level, this the software is essential actually for the optimization of the physical kit. It can also cut costs and speed up with permitting, but these are complex projects and complex initiatives. And I think part of what we're so excited about is not only with in terms of the carbon reduction, but then also the mitigations like with renewables, how you can also lean in and think about combined projects that heretofore would be too complicated, but now technology and pricing and so forth is enabling these types of hybrid solutions, the combinations of offshore wind with storage and so forth. And these are things we're very excited about. And so <laughs> is that the cue? Is that the, that, that's the jump off the stage cue? <laughs> Wake up, guys. <laughs> This will also be open mic night, so we'll have yeah. comedy in our in, our, in the gravitas of our topic. But but the key the key that we're very very excited about is about this is about how we make things practical. So I'll I'll stop there with my opening comments, Paul. Thank you, Elizabeth, and we will revert to you and the others. I will actually ask you to s remain here because our intention is that everyone shall come up and give very brief interventions, and then we shall go directly into a. Uh, a Q&A session. So why don't you come here over with me, and then I shall call up uh, Hanne Rulén, who is head of sustainability at Arkid Carbon Capture, because you, Hanne, you are who provide the technology and the equipment to actually do the thing you want to do is to remove carbon ca um, dioxide from the atmosphere. So if you take this microphone and tell us a little bit about trust in cooperation from your perspective. Thank you so much, Paul. Yes, so Arca Carbon Capture was established in 2020. And even though that we are still a young company, our technology is not. Because we have been maturing this technology in the Arca family for decades already. 
But back then, we saw that there was a momentum around CCS and the need for CCS in order to reach net zero and part of the solution. And uh, carbon capture has actually several roles to play towards net zero. Uh, of course, uh, very important is the decarbonization and uh, both towards the hard weight industries, such as cement, steel, and so on, uh, but also in the energy transition to enable the dispatchable power that is in combination with wind power, sun power, but again, what we need when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing. But very important, together with that, is also to enable carbon removal. So. To add to that, I would just like to say that the technology is already being deployed. We are currently constructing two facilities, uh, one at the cement facility in Drevik in Norway, and this is actually the very first carbon capture facility at a cement facility. So this is extremely important milestone in terms of the decarbonization. And uh, together with that, we are also constructing the um, the carbon capture at the waste to energy plant at Twens in the Netherlands, another sector that is actually quite a kinder egg uh, when it comes to decarbonization, uh, providing low carbon energy as well as the potential around carbon removal. So I think I stop there and then we'll continue. Thank you very much, Hanne. If you leave the microphone there, mm -hmm. then I shall call up Randi Schitte, who is head of regulatory uh, development, regulation and development at. Ørsted. Let me just say that, you know, for us, Ørsted is the new guy on the CCS block. Because I worked for many, many years in Brussels on CCS, and we never saw Ørsted. But now you are here, and we're so eager to hear your perspective and what your needs to allow this trust and confidence take place. Please, Randi. Thank you very much for being here today and a uh, warm welcome to all of you. So as you say, uh, Paul, we, are, we in Ørsted, we've been a huge journey on uh, the transition. We used to be um, an oil and coal major and uh, we took a very bold decision that this was not the way going forward. And we basically transformed our business and are today a global leader within offshore energy. And uh, we've been focusing on decarbonizing the power production out there but we want to go further. We acknowledge this is not enough. We want to create a world that runs entirely on green energy. And that means that we have to move into the space of deep de decarbonization. And this is where uh, we are beginning to show interest in carbon capture because we in Denmark have uh, some uh, biomass fired uh, combined heat and power stations and they provide uh, biogenic CO2 that we can capture providing negative emissions or on the long term utilize and uh, substitute uh, fossil fuels for instance in the aviation industry so this is an emerging market for us and we are we cannot do this alone and this is why we are very excited to be here today uh, with you with, who, with whom we have a, a strong collaboration already which we want to extend further so thank you thank you very, uh, very much and um, now I'm pleased to call on the scene, Nils Drøkke, who is the uh, Vice President Sustainability of Sintef. Unnecessarily to say that Sintef and Nils have been one of the pioneers in developing CCS technology from a very early stage. So Nils, you must be very pleased to see the kind of reactions that we have experienced today. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, I'm old enough to recall Dong. And the Esbjerg, the pilot actually, was, which was running through one of the projects, which one of the first we did in the EU framework, which was called CASTA. And um, that was, a, I mean, it's kind of full cycle now, coming back to the need to remove CO2. And uh, um, not only to reduce, but also to remove, as been discussed here. And I think the, um, the, uh, the heading of this session is very telling about partnership and actually Sintef as a research institute. 2,200 people. Um, this is really our business model is based upon partnerships, you know, and, and we have partnerships through projects uh, with all of you, and um, we are enjoying this this symbiosis. And I think to be able to uh, for us to to deliver deliver on our targets, which says that in our strategy says that the uh, UN SDGs is leading for all our activities, 
we need to team up with these partners. Thank you, Niels. So now we have the panel, and now we have to dive into a little bit more nitty gritty and some of the difficult issues. Obviously, there are a set of difficult issues that we are confronted with. We, you mentioned trust. You mentioned the digital uh, infrastructure, the physical infrastructure. Let me start by just asking you, um, you know, the role of partnerships. What is the role of partnerships and what, is, what does that consist of? How closely do you need to cooperate to make this happen? It's a really important question, and I think it's been touched upon. None of us can do it alone. Mm. And I think then, again, being very respectful of antitrust boundaries, we can partner very closely. And I think that's the key. And I think what's interesting, if you think about the panel members represented here, we have distinct and different business models. So they're complementary. And so this is where I think there's incredible opportunity to have deep and meaningful partnerships, because it starts with being clear, clear about your own business model. We're a software technology company. We are not going to be building CSUS. However, we know that the engineered solutions and the credibility that they provide create a really important um, piece for us because we need to actually, oh, sorry, you cannot hear. Just hold it close, hold okay. on your chin. Sorry. So what I was saying is partnerships is incredibly important to us and again, making sure that you're aware of any antitrust boundaries, being able to partner deeply in a meaningful way um, is going to unlock the potential of the market. And so for us at Microsoft, we know who we are as a technology company. And so being distinct about then our roles that we can play enable those deep types of partnerships. And you know, we're, we're a growth company and so we are gonna continue our demand as we grow and have more data center compute, as much efficiency as we tried to build, it's not enough. So we need to figure out how we can purchase more and more supply that's credible and again can be verified, and at the same time being able to enable the acceleration as I mentioned earlier. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me now turn to uh, Erondi because you, Ashton is not only a newcomer, but you are actually aiming at storing CO2 on shore now that demands a lot of trust. So how could you take advantage of this partnership to convey the trust that you need to give to public opinion? So first of all, um, the question about where to store, we leave that to the state of Denmark to find credible solutions because this is a, a huge issue where we want to make sure that everything is okay. So we do not, that's a risk that we basically do not want to take and, that, and we think that it's better placed with the government mm. to, to make that infrastructure. But I think that's one of the challenges that we have when we talk about carbon capture, the infrastructure, that we do not have that in place. Um, so I would also like to echo what you're saying about partnerships. So this is, as you said, Nils, uh, we did it before, but uh, it's a long time ago and it was a very small scale. Now we need to scale up. We need the technologies. It's very expensive just now. It will come down, obviously, and it will be more efficient, but it's a huge risk. It's a technology risk. It's a regulatory risk, and we have to have a close cooperation. We have to have somebody to walk along with uh, to de-risk uh, these, uh, these things. Thank you. So let's turn to Hanna, because you actually are in dialogue many different stakeholders in the CCS value chain. What do you see as the role of partnership in your conversation with your partners? Oh yeah. We are absolutely dependent on partnerships in order to get us where we need to be. Uh, we are a dedicated carbon capture company and of course we need the full value chain and we need the full value chain to scale together. Uh, because carbon capture and storage is not an either or. We, we need a place uh, where to store the captured CO2 obviously. Uh, so that is why it's so important that we build that value chain. And of course, as you uh, emphasized, Elizabeth, we need the, the ecosystem around it as well. We need both the physical value chain and we need the digital value chain to support it. Great. So, Niels, um, you know, we have discussed so many times the issue of public perception and the, the need to share uh, information both to the public and to the industrial partners. 
you have a project called CO2 Data Share. Could you tell us a little bit how this can be a tool to foster these kind of partnerships? Yeah, sure. I mean, we'll show a video about uh, that later on as well. But this is really about sharing um, storage data. And uh, to do that, not only from Norwegian and continental shelf, but also to include other sites which voluntarily want to share the data. And we've got the Illinois project in the US, uh, which is uh, sharing data through this uh, platform. We've had the amazing amount of downloads of the uh, data for these storage uh, sites. Um, and make it available so people can trust that you know these data are available for everybody to investigate and to use uh, to model how uh, storage is developing. I mean, uh, when you inject uh, CO2 into the underground, um, there will be movement of the plume, but um, uh, when you can control that, when you know where it's moving, and you know the uh, when you're qualified the store, so you know what is the pore volume. And what is the uh, uh, mobility in that uh, in that specific uh, area? You can build trust upon that it will actually stay here. You know, and I, I think that's so important because I've seen so much being said about CO2. Everything from it, can it explode or you know can it just start to burn and things like that, which is hugely I mean o really off you know. But it, it's something we need to take honestly and earnestly. And, and to, to show what are the, the real, what are the facts about this. Mm -hmm. So I have, of course, I have, I have great faith in, in science and facts. Yeah. So I wanted to bring the debate a little bit over to another controversial issue or a conundrum that we are facing, which is the difference between reduction and removal. But before we do that, should we have a look at that film? when we talk about data sharing. I'm good with that, yeah. Is that yeah. okay? <laughs> and then we can sit down and watch the film and then we can go back to dealing with that issue. Now. CCS facilities in Trondheim, uh, in the middle of Norway, uh, and I'm re representing the Norwegian CCS Research Center. It's the world's largest uh, CCS uh, research project, uh, and we cover the whole CCS chain from capture, transport, storage to chain. Uh, one issue which is very important is to make sure we have the right data available and that these, these data are shared uh, to the common uh, CCS community. Uh, I'm working in this um, project that is called CO2 Data Share, and that is the first open digital portal for sharing CCS data. And we promote the international sharing of uh, CO2 uh, data, and also supporting the UN sustainability goals uh, related to climate action. So far, we have been focusing on CO2 storage data. CCS facilities in Trondheim, uh, in the middle of Norway, uh, and I'm re representing the Norwegian CCS Research Center. It's the world's largest uh, CCS uh, research project, uh, and we cover the whole CCS chain from capture, transport, storage to chain. Uh, one issue which is very important is to make sure we have the right data available and that these, these data are shared uh, to the common uh, CCS community. 
Uh, I'm working in this um, project that is called CO2 Data Share, and that is the first open digital portal for sharing CCS data. And we promote the international sharing of uh, CO2 uh, data and also supporting the UN sustainability goals uh, related to climate action. So far, we have been focusing on CO2 storage data. So data in CCS is important because a lot of what we're doing in geologic storage is happening in the subsurface. And so we have to collect only a limited amount of information that's available. So whatever information that we get is going to be what we're going to use to characterize the reservoir and then to monitor that reservoir. So the data piece is absolutely critical to making sure that uh, geologic storage of CO2 is safe and secure. The, the ambition going forward is to uh, expand the portal so that we cover the whole chain. This is available to everybody. So the, the data can be accessed from, uh, from everywhere. Uh, and we see a great interest in the current data sets that we have available. Um, there are, we have recorded more than 20,000 downloaded components for, from, this, uh, from this portal and from several hundred organizations uh, and from more than 50 countries over the world. As we all know, cooperation is important. In order to enable the energy transition and sustainable ways to future economic growth, we need to find common ground. Norway has a long history with CCS. We started 25 years ago with Sleipner, and we have learned a lot since then. We know it works, we know it's safe, and not least, we know that cooperation between political decision makers and the industry provides results. Various Norwegian governments have supported technology development, testing and pilot projects for many years, which has culminated in the Longship project creating a full industrial-scale CCS value chain. This project has created vast amounts of precious data, and our ambition is to share. By sharing reference datasets from pioneering CO2 storage projects, CO2 Data Share seeks to accelerate improved understanding, build capacity, reduce costs, and minimize uncertainties associated with CO2 storage in deep geological formations. Our hope is that many will take advantage of this data, learn from Norway's long CCX experience, and adopt their own CCS projects. So this is certainly something we need to pursue, uh, that we can expand to the other uh, parts of the CCS chain uh, and collect and secure the relevance of and the quality of uh, data for covering the whole CCS chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we believe that that will be essential for actually being able to have cost-efficient and safe CCS. Yes, and trust in CCS is something the world needs. And I invite the panel to come back up again. So. That is a very succinct and clear articulation of what we are trying to discuss and achieve here. Are there any comments you want to make from what you saw? Oh, I think this uh, is both a very good example of uh, the importance of sharing knowledge from the, the uh, history and experience from uh, storage uh, and to, to get trust through the access to data and certainty. And as you said before, you believe in science and, and facts. And this is a very good example of, of this for the CCS part and the technology. And likewise, I think that is a very good uh, link towards what we are trying to do on the digital value chain when it comes to carbon removal. Yeah, so I thought maybe you would like to uh, add on to that. <laughs> Yes. Now we have to really speak loud with the microphone closed because we are competing with the Democratic Republic of Congo. We are. <laughs> so, so, yes, Hannah, it's really, really key. The digital value chain is actually with good data, we can actually create the pull because part of what will lower the cost and enable the acceleration, <coughs> it's not good because my voice is, I'm losing my voice, is also 
to make sure that we're having the data that can match where the demand is to pull the supply with the creation of it. And that will help de-risk the projects. And so that's part of what I think is really practical on a commercial perspective, in addition to the demystification that you were talking about. You know, this section is being filmed before it's put online, all right? So I suggest that we wait for this wrapper to finish, and then we'll play back to you. Is that okay? Because it's, it's we, can, we can easily cut it. There is no way we can compete with him. I could try, but <laughs> <laughs> so I want to. I, I think we want to start this from uh, after the after we show the video, and uh, I will ask then Elizabeth to sum up first. No, it was a, yeah, Hannah. Okay, no, now we, we can do. We could do the singing now, probably. Yeah. yeah just to compete. Yeah. So yeah. So you heard what Elizabeth said. But we want to. Um, well, I said, you said, yeah. So you go, Kit. You go, and then I go. Or if you do that again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> go. Well, I think that was a really good example of how we need to take the knowledge, the experience that we have when it comes to storage to build that trust that the solution works and thinking about exactly what we need and back to what you said before Elizabeth when it comes to carbon removal and that digital value chain throughout so maybe you would like to comment on that thank you so much Hannah part of it with trust is being able to have that data so that you can demystify as we've talked about before but then also be able to create the better intelligence and telemetry as it were so that you can actually create the supply demand matching that pulls through the value chain because we want to accelerate the lowering of cost for these big projects we want to de-risk them so part of that is making sure we have that good data so that also the people you know in Microsoft's the case we're, we want to purchase how do you know and you can have predictability of when these projects are going to come online and how much carbon you can remove and store and so all of this data creates that ecosystem that accelerates the transition. I take away two key points from the, uh, from the movie or the, the, the film. So first of all, we need international solutions uh, the, to be able to trade across borders, to be able to cooperate around across borders. And then I think it is very important to also adhere to the reductions hierarchy and the mitigation hierarchy that we, when we talk about carbon capture and storage, it must also be acknowledged to be the last resort. We need to keep focus on the reductions uh, from the first place. And I think this is key to actually gaining that trust. And again, uh, supporting that it's actually the way that it's done. Nils, would you like to give your five cents on what you saw in the movie? Well, I mean, this is one example of partnerships, you know, and how we are sharing to develop trust into this uh, this area. But I think also through projects we are conducting um, in the European Framework programs, uh, through um, the Research Council and through joint industrial projects, we're also building trust because we're involving the different stakeholders in those projects. I mean, we have had NGOs being part of projects uh, on, on CCS, and th that's been key, I think, in understanding you know, what are the concerns and what do we need to address here. For instance, um, when we did this um, uh, landmark project with, uh, with Arkel some years ago, uh, which is now the uh, which is backbone of the technology there, it's a Solvit project, there was a concern about amines and what are the environmental mm. effect on that and what is the effect on the humans, you know? Well, um, then we went into that in a partnership, look at what are the real problems here. And we were able to, through a partnership in Europe, to find the right facilities to look at what are the generation of this, how is the destruction of it, and how does it end up in the, in the nature a and in humans. And by this concerted effort, we were able to show that this is something which can be controlled and also, by the way, during that process, there was also developed a new control technology just to 
to avoid that there are any mines which are uh, which are uh, then spread out from from the chimneys, you know. So I think this this kind of partnership is key. And as I I'm, I'm coming back to, this is actually the basis of our business model in Sintef: open innovation. Great, thank you. So let me then give the floor back to Elizabeth because as you are a first mover, we have discussed a lot in this room today about the regulatory framework for these carbon markets, which belongs to Article 6.4 or something, but it's not yet there. So there needs to be a trust in, as Neil says, in the commercial, uh, the commercial model. Could you say how you as Microsoft deal with the uncertainty of that market? Yes, well part of how we're dealing with the uncertainty is adding our voice and our weight to help define and create the certainty, which starts with the vocabulary. It starts with how we communicate it. And, and so we put and publish very robust quality standards and they're on our Microsoft website. We've also been very, very clear about what we will, what we will purchase and what we will not purchase and why. And so that transparency is essential for trust. So leaning in and part of actually putting our brand and our weight and our credibility and ultimately our, our pocketbook behind being able to say, this is the standard. We've set a very high standard and been very robust about making sure that that sticks. And so we anticipate the regulation. Meanwhile, in the voluntary market, we want to make sure that that high quality standard and that points to engineered solutions. And that's what's really important because you want to know the duration, you want to know the quantity, you want to de-risk over a period of time. All of those things point to credibility. And I should note that credibility is actually a term of art in the financial regulations. And so if you know where the climate regulations are occurring, they are occurring with the financial regulator. So we, can, we know and we can anticipate there will be a, the assurance that this will be audited, it will go to board audit committees for listed companies, and so as a result, the data has to be robust and therefore the standards. And so we've leaned in to help establish what we see as a really important marker for quality. And then further from a technology perspective, we have also launched in public preview the software infrastructure to help support the creation of a market, environmental credit services. It is not in general full general availability yet, but we are building that backbone as part of our cloud for sustainability. And it is all about verification, trust, making sure that that value chain is understood. And so in turn, going all the way back, anticipating more regulation, everyone can stand tall and proud and say, yes, this is the right thing to do and a good thing to do. If I may add to that, I think a lot uh, or important area for the, uh, for the maturation of the voluntary carbon market is knowledge. Uh, what we see in the market today is that there is a lot of uh, reduction or avoidance, avoidance credits. Uh, but here we're talking about removal and what does that mean? And I think going back again to the facts there and, and understanding the difference is so important. So uh, when we do talk about removal, that is actually in some capacity take out carbon from the atmosphere. And that could be through uh, bioenergy together with carbon capture and permanent storage. Uh, we hear about the direct air capture as uh, these are the core technology solutions that is available today. Uh, and the, the great difference here is of course the permanency and the low risk of reversibility compared to some of the nature-based solutions that of course is also important part of the full picture. Uh, but again, when it comes to carbon removals and the upscale here, this is something that we uh, need in order to reach net zero. So let's follow up that with it only because you work in the regulatory department of Ørsted. You're a member of EU, you're involved in the EU development. So who's going to win this race to make this regulatory framework that's needed for these commercial operations? The companies, the national authorities, EU, the US, which is doing a lot in this issue? That's a good question, and I don't think I have the right short answer to that. But how we go about it is that it's right now we have a tender in Denmark for a CCS, uh, 400,000 tons of CO2 captured in storage by uh, 2026, and that's going to be quite interesting. And we need that, pop that it's a huge part of public funding but it's quite a small amount. And if you talk about magnitude of scale, 400,000 tons is not a lot. We need a lot more. 
So we believe that public funding, this fund has really pushed the development of the technologies. It has pushed the projects forward. So we believe that it's essential, but it's not going to be enough. This is also why we look into the voluntary carbon market to see we need to mobilize uh, private investment to raise capital to these uh, capex heavy projects, which they are at the time for the time being. So that has to go again. And we do not, in the voluntary carbon market, the regulatory framework shouldn't be a barrier. We should work together. But we also need to focus on working together. And the last thing maybe about the international part, we need to have a certain threshold of standards that we can adhere to across, I hope, next week that we will land this discussion here at the COP. That would be great because then we have a common standard in the world. That's what we wish for. Mm -hmm. Nils, you have been a little bit involved in the EU sustainable carbon cycle work. Are you worried about the lack of distinction here between the different carbon markets? Well, first of all, I think it's really good that um, this uh, communication came out about uh, sustainable carbon cycles and that the commissioner is now, is now is taking it seriously. I mean, it has stated 5 million tons by 2030 by technical means, by technological engineered uh, solutions. And, um, well, I think this is in excess of 200 actually natural-based uh, solutions. Um, so I think this is, um, uh, I mean, behind that you need to have the, the market uh, mechanism and you need to have the requirements. So what is then counted as removed and not, which we had developed earlier on today here in a, in a session which looked at that and the uh, Article 6, 4 and so forth. Um, and up to now, as we know, all these voluntary mechanisms, they don't, they don't connect to 6.4, they don't connect to Article 6. Um, I think that's really important um, because this is about trust. And uh, for instance, in our company, when we were making our new uh, strat strategy for the company, um, we saw that we have own emissions, I mean, scope one and, um, well, there is scope two as well. Scope three is always like we are doing good, so there is abundance of reductions which are happening there, but it's really hard to make them tangible. Wh what are they? You know? And uh, then the uh, idea or, uh, or the discussion was there about, well, maybe we should just buy quotas and you know, we've, we're done. There's no trust in that system that it actually removes um, carbon and that those certificates or whatever which is surrender, that they're real. So the researchers didn't want to have it. Um, and we were thinking, okay, um, we agree on that because the transparency and it's not the same kind of systems they are using, using either. I, I guess that's the same as Microsoft was doing in the, the, the review, you know, that these are not fully transparent and we don't know how it, how it, how it quite works. Um, we said, okay, we will invest the money. I mean, we put price tag on $100 per ton, which we are emitting in Sintef. We'll invest it in own research in own research to come up with solutions which can remove carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases from the atmosphere from the embryonic stage, you know, and um, uh, put money to that with a total now, or I think we are up to 10 projects, five is still running, um, to bring those technologies and to think outside the box. I mean, everybody's talking about air capture, you know, well, a great thing, of course, but um, what other possibilities are there? For instance, removing carbon dioxide from water, we're working on, on that. We're also working on removing methane and nitrous oxide in an embryotic kind of technology as in actors. And I think that's, that's really important that we, we now uh, uh, accelerate these kind of technologies. And, and I'm happy to see that there is a, a partnership amo among you, you know, to look into what you can do in the carbon removal part to be tangible and actually remove carbon from the from the atmosphere and, and not to go into these kind of cycles where there's talk about circularity, which we know it's never full circularity, um, and where there's uh, re-emitting uh, re uh, emissions. Great. Let me, <coughs> let me challenge you. You want to say something more about that? Yeah, because, okay, because you, you asked it on the hair about who will win the race yes. around the regulatory. Yep. Uh, and I would just like to point that 
the importance, I think, of, of the work that Microsoft started off with, mm. not waiting for the regulations, but just mm. get started. Because yep. if we all are waiting for the regulations yep. to come in place, we will never get there. We'll wait for Godot. Yeah. So we are in Egypt, we are in Africa. We call it now the global majority that we've heard <laughs> here today, tonight. How would you relate this technology and these ambitions that we have to this part of of the globe? Sh should it only we do it in the so-called rich world? Or how do we make the, the leap, the transformation to making it available to the global majority? It's absolutely essential that we have knowledge transfer. And as a matter of fact, Microsoft published earlier this week a skills sustainability skills report that really brings highlights that out. And so one of the things that's key is recognizing with knowledge transfer, and this it, again on the science, is that there are countries in Africa that have geological formations that make direct air capture or CCUS viable, such as Kenya. So how do we make sure that there's knowledge transfer and, for example, your research and your can actually lift that economy and how we can actually provide opportunities of this technology to actually exist in other places, such as Kenya, that can provide jobs, innovation, new companies, partnerships, and also, quite frankly, have part of what we want to do is we want to have the removal proximate to where there is the production. And the fact of the matter is energy access is essential. Growth of the economy in Africa across these countries is essential. So society here on the African continent will continue to need even more energy. And so how do we make sure that that, that is localized? So it's, I think it's an incredible discussion. It's really, really relevant. And, and I'm pleased to say, actually, I had the chance here at COP to meet some amazing entrepreneurs actually working in this space. So how do we lift them up and how do we support that community of an ecosystem that's bigger and broader than the global north? Please. Yeah, so in Elstead, we've committed to being CO2 neutral in uh, 2025. And uh, as we've talked about, we try to reduce all the things we can, but there will be something left. And for that, we need to go into the field of offsets. And we actually cooperate with uh, several countries here in Africa to uh, focus also on nature-based solutions. Uh, in the we have a project in Gambia and uh, some others uh, coming up. And the way we go about it is to use the same criteria for the nature-based solution because, to be honest, there are, quite f a there are a lot of low-quality projects in that area as well. Uh, so we go very close into project development and use the same principle and criteria to uh, adhere also to, uh, to to the engineered solutions. And finally, what we also do, which I think which can scale to everywhere, is that we adhere to the science-based targets to uh, kind of get the data, get, the f uh, get everything more credible and, and focus on that way. Anyone else? No. Yeah, I had some thoughts on this as well. Please. And I think uh, when we look back, and uh, I think that you could compliment on this, Nils, is the how, how much time we have spent just to get to now these first uh, carbon capture and storage projects that is in construction right now. Uh, what we need to make sure moving forward is this timeline just need to be squeezed down some mm. as much as we can. And this mm. is how we can really speed up, scale up uh, across the, the globe, basically. And interesting, Nils, did you want to say something? Or? Well, I mean, um, as, we're, as we're at the COP, it's a very relevant question yeah. you're asking. You know, and I, I was discussing with uh, the ladies here about, you know, what if there was not the COP? You know? mm. That would be uh, what the situation we would be in then. Mm. And then we would be targeting uh, much higher global t uh, warming temperatures than we, we see now, although we know that this is really boring as well as we're above two, you know, uh, and above 1.5. But um, um, I, w I was thinking about these uh, discussions here about uh, climate fi financing and the 100 billion and to scale this uh, further up. Um, I was thinking, uh, why don't we look into mechanisms where you can fund this kind of partnership with African partners, you know, for instance, African partners, I would say. I mean, we're talking about the global majority and it's not only Africa. But to uh, uh, deploy these kind of solutions and do deploy the, these kind of technologies and also to have partnership in education and research and innovation 
which can be funded through a mechanism like that. That's something which we are keen to, uh, to follow up on and that we cannot do in isolation. Then we need to partnerships. Mm. Mm. The, you said something earlier about we have to fix this now at COP. So what can COP do about Article 6.4 at, at this juncture? <laughs> Yeah, so I think a lot of this is to agree that we need the we need um, a credible compliance markets. We need the nations to be ambitious, but we also need private capital to come in there. There are a lot of uh, interesting companies, and and you have a lot of interest, and I really think that you are a catalyst for change. What you're doing in Microsoft because you're am very ambitious, and uh, I think that there's a lot of companies like that who want to inspire to be more ambitious in this field. And they should be allowed to go ahead and do all the things that they can without being slowed down by, regula re by regulation. So, so my wish for the outcome is that yes, we have strong ambitions, high ambitions on the compli on compliance markets, but that we allow for the voluntary market to develop and to be credible and to be uh, an international market. Great. Anyone else want to talk about that before I challenge you, Elizabeth? Because, you know, I'm Microsoft. Just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> you said it beautifully, Randy. <laughs> because you were an important first mover. Have you seen other companies picking up the ball like you've done, and running with you, or are you still a little bit alone out there? We're still a little lonely. We're still a little lonely, but, you know, the good thing is, is we're having. We're a catalyst for conversation, and I think that's really important. And we're, we talked about partnerships before. We're a catalyst for partnerships, and that becomes really important as well, where we have more and more partners and customers of ours want to come to us and say, well, we're not quite sure we want to do this project alone, but would, would you share it with us? And that's great, and that's great. And so that it's the buddy system, right? And so I think that's important, but also building on something you said, Randy, as well, is that you know this is but tried and true. If you think about any technology becoming commercially viable and the opening of regulation and policy, is that government leaders by nature are conservative, so they need to see proof points. We have to show them as the private sector the art of the possible. And so that's one of the reasons why we're bold. And then through the partnerships on major projects like this, we can demonstrate the art of the possible, which then and, s and then set the stage for what the right market mechanisms and regulations and other things could look like. And so we're actually creating a conversation and showing the way. And I think that's really important. And that's something that Microsoft certainly invites and encourages others that it's time for action now here at COP. This is the decade. And so it's time to actually, we want to build a community, and, it, and that's why we inv invested in the environmental credit services, so that we can help that, and we can help accelerate it, because the time is now. And finally, Halna, you, you, know, you demonstrate that this is the technology is there. You're actually doing it. I mean, you must be a little bit frustrated that the whole world is not coming to you to ask, asking for your technology. What do you expect from this? Well, I think that uh, seeing the momentum over just the last couple of years, I mean, the technology has been there for decades, but it's just these couple of years how we've seen that this has been picked up. Let's just uh, hope that it will continue to do so and uh, to really do the implementation as we're all talking about here at COP and, and shift from pledges to progress. That's what we, we all need. And I hope that uh, we will do the same. I'm, I'm extremely proud of the partners here. Uh, it's about sticking in it, uh, thinking about Sintef and how we have been together in maturing the technology. And to each of my partners here for the transition that has been taking place, and thank you particularly for, from, uh, for you, Ørsted. Uh, and also in Microsoft that set so ambitious targets that you had no idea how to get there, but still you do it. And that's what is going to drive us forward. All right. I think we pretty much covered it, didn't we? So um, unless someone wants to have a last word, I would like to thank you for coming. Thank you for a great discussion. Thank you for you who has been watching in the audience and on the screen. And uh, have a great evening. <laughs>